Today is the 18th day of February 2015, and we have a special guest of honor, Prema Nandakumar, author of many, many books, daughter of the very illustrious father, K.R. Srinivas Iyengar. Welcome, Prema. Namaste. Namaste. Can we begin with your father? Because you have so much to tell about him, so many wonderful memories of his writings and his experience with Sri Aurobindo and Mother. Yes. So let us begin. But then there. that would fill volumes. Yes, it would. <laughs> uh, the point is, I lived with my father for 60 years. That is, from the moment I was born till he passed away in 1999. So, in one sense, my own life, whole life as it is, became one long uh, Gurukula Vasa. We, we speak of Gurukula Vasa. A student stays with the teacher yes. and learns, lives with the teacher and learns. Yes. So that way it was, it was a very, very fulfilling Gurukula Vasa. It was an honor and a penance, you would say, because uh, there was so much of love in his teaching. But also there was the kind of conditioning, you think. Uh, I mean, you were all constantly worried whether you can come up to his expectations. Because he was so high, by the time I began to learn about life around me. Uh, well. My life with uh, my father, you can say it began before I was born, because he wrote a short story in 1937 that uh, it, it's a story about a young couple who have a daughter called Prema, who is very mischievous. And 39, I was born, so I got the name. So you can say I knew him even before I was born. And uh, he didn't think much of educating me in the normal manner, because he could not. He was staying in places where there were no schools around nearby for me. But I had the free run of his library. He had an excellent personal library. And uh, my mother taught me how to read and write in Tamil, English. So that was the kind of early education I had. Then I was away from them for a couple of years with my grandparents. Then I came back to them. That was when I had some regular schooling. Like I wrote my matriculation, intermediate, BA honors. Now, by the time I came to the college, I realized he was not an ordinary person. When I entered the Andhra University as a student of English literature, then I suddenly realized, oh, he is the professor, he is my professor. And his speeches are so wonderful, and everybody looks up to him like that, you know. This in spite of the fact that from my childhood, I have been taking long walks with him, morning and evening. We used to take long walks on the Ramakrishna beach. There's a beautiful beach skirting the Bay of Bengal in Vishakhapatnam, where I, in Andhra Pradesh, where I lived. So that way, from say 1954 onwards, you can say I became consciously of his work. And that was when I realized he was so much into the Aurobindonian world. And oh, this book on Sri Aurobindo is written by my father. This book on the mother is written by my father. Though whatever, what did I know about Sri Aurobindo and the mother at that time? Not much. The portraits were there and my parents were totally dedicated to those portraits. And my father would read Savitri, I would sit near him, I would not understand anything. As a child, I didn't understand. And this is how I became conscious of my father's work with the Arbindonian world. And subsequently, of course, I took up Savitri as my subject for doctoral research. And my father was the guide. And I was lucky because he was there to teach me every line of Savitri help me write each chapter, correct them, recorrect them, and 
he got me in uh, touch with the uh, Pondicherry community, the Arabindonian world at large. And so it has been that kind of life with my father. So how do I explain it to you? Yeah. <laughs> well, Prema has written uh, the only the only other book on savagery that I truly appreciate it appreciate and um, the other book is by A. B. Purani. So her volume and Purani's volume stand side by side in my library. Oh, so nice of you to say that. But where is Purani? Where am I? <laughs> you love savagery. And you read savagery. <laughs> and you know that it is not philosophy. Yes. It's not philosophy. It is experience, isn't it? Yes. Yes. You experience savitri. You, yeah. When you read every line, you have to experience the background emotion. Suppose when Sri Aurobindo says, all in her pointed to a nobler kind. Have you come across a better line? No. To describe some great personality whom you admire. All in her pointed to a nobler kind. And you see, I had a wonderful mother-in-law. And uh, I gifted to her a copy of Savitri. And I wrote uh, on the flyleaf, to Mami with love from Prema, all in her pointed to a nobler kind. So she saw that and asked me, that's a beautiful phrase you have made, though I don't deserve it, that's what she said. I don't deserve it, but it's a very beautiful phrase. I said, Amma, there are 24,000 lines of such beautiful lines in uh, Savitri. And she was delighted, she began to read Savitri. She was a famous writer in Tamil. That was the catalyst, that <laughs> one line, I think. All in her point. Yes. And truly she was a very noble person. So that way it is like this. So we how did your father come in contact with Sri Aurobindo? Tell us a bit about his background, education, and work. Now that's a very interesting question, Narad. Uh, father was born in the far south of India. He was born in a very poor family, and by sheer grit, he came up meritoriously. He worked for a couple of years in Sri Lanka, two, three years. Then, much later, he became a lecturer in Belgaum, uh, which is near Bombay. I think it is in Maharashtra. When he was in Belgaum, he, he was surprised. He had become a reviewer of books by then. What surprised him was some of the Indians seemed to write very beautiful English. As good English as English. Father loved English literature like anything. Then, well, look at Gandhi, such a simple person. His English is so beautiful. Of course, Pandit Nehru is good. And then Raja Ram Mohan Roy. These people are writing such beautiful English. And now they have started writing creative works also. There is a Henry Vivian De Rosio, an Indian, is writing in Sarojini Naidu, Thorudat. They are all writing uh, poetry which is yeah. even better than some of the English poets. And then even novels. Look at K.S. Venkatramani of Tamil Nadu. He has written Kandan the Patriot. It, in, it is on yeah. um, uh, the freedom movement. It was about to be banned, that book. Such, he was a famous um, lawyer also, Venkatramani. So this uh, set him thinking. So he began writing one or two articles on Indians writing in English. But the, um, but the discipline as such had not come to his mind at that time. But when he wrote some of these articles, uh, Sophia Wadia, who was the editor of the Aryan Path and uh, the Indian PEN, she asked him, why don't you write a small book on these Indians who handle English so well? So this is how the discipline was born. When he began writing for that book, it's a slender book, he came across a few sonnets of Sri Aurobindo. Somewhere, we don't know, somewhere. I don't know where he got them. I knew Sri Aurobindo as, he knew him as Aurobindo Ghosh. He knew this Aurobindo Ghosh as a politician 
the famous Alipur case and that he had retired to Pondicherry and given up writing and all that. So these sonnets, maybe he has written a few more. If I could get a few more of his poems, maybe I could write a paragraph or page on him. So then he was wondering, then he was directed to the correspondent of uh, the college in which he was working, Lingaraj College. That was one Shankar Gauda. He was the zamindar of one Tumuri or something. So father went to him. He said, sir, I believe you go to Pondicherry. Some of my colleagues say you go to Pondicherry. I believe Arbindo Ghosh has retired there. Have you met him, sir? I believe he has written some poems. Can you get me a few poems? Then Shankar Gauda smiles at him and says, Young man, first have your tea. So tea was brought him. It was Amindar's house. My father was a poor lecturer at that time. Then he went in and brought two fat volumes. They are still with me. Two fat volumes, collected poems and plays of Sri Aurobindo. Volume 1, Volume 2. Published just then, August 1942. To commemorate uh, the 70th birthday of Sri Aurobindo, 1942, 70th birthday. So father was amazed and he opens it, says to Shankar Gauda, uh, with blessings, Sri Aurobindo, you know the famous handwriting of Sri Aurobindo. You know. Father is astonished, then he makes a request, sir, can I sit in the veranda and take down some notes from these books, sir? Then Shankar Gauda said he had heard about father. He, because father had already made a name for himself but as he a speaker. Very, he was still very young. He was very young. This, uh, this happened in 1942. He was 34 years. 34 years. Uh, father was born in 1908. But by then he had made, established a name as a political writer and also a literary student. And then uh, Shankar Gowda said, oh, young man, you can take it home. But please return it after one week, because the master has inscribed. So father was elated, he came home. And my mother has reported to me again and again, till, the last, till her last day, how the whole night my father did not sleep. And the, in the morning when she gets up and comes out, he's still typing. And the article gets finished by 9.30, so he has some kind of food and goes away to the college to deliver his lectures. Those were the days when teachers taught in the colleges. So he <laughs> went and gave the lectures and then he came back to my mother. He said, I'm going to, for my evening walk. So he went to Shankar Gauda's house. He gave back the books. Shankar Gauda could not believe. He thought maybe this young man did not like or just taken some notes. <coughs> Did you read any of them? Sir, I read both the volumes. Here is the article, sir. Entire thing is there. From page one to last page, what material, what he has read, what he has studied. That's the whole thing is there. Shankar Gauda realized that he had hit upon some new force in his life. So he said, I'm very happy. I want to show this to the master. I'll be going again in November, I think. I will show it to the master. And he had it uh, typed uh, with uh, more space. So he, my father even told me the name of the typist, Ta, Tatya Sahib, the Shankar Gauda's uh, typist. He, he at that did time. enlarge a space for Sri Aurobindo's eyes because Sri Aurobindo's huh, eyes were. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because Sri Aurobindo <clears throat> found it difficult to read at that time. This was in 1942, no? So he took it and it, he sent it to the master. He read it. He even suggested a couple of corrections. And the article came back. I don't know. It was published somewhere. That's all I remember. I've been searching the his archival material for that. I've not had oh. come to it, but I'm sure I will get it. It was printed somewhere. From then onward, Shankar Gauda said, you must write the master's biography. But how can father write the biography? He is sitting in Belgium. He has no idea of Sri Aurobindo except these two volumes. And of course, what he has gathered from other books on history. Then Shankar Gauda said, he will take him to Pondicherry, introduce people to him. But he must take up this project. 
But at that time, there were very few publications of Sri Aurobindo. Yes, there are not many. Not many. So father came, he interviewed many people. Oh. Then, uh, and Nalinida, these are some names ready to come to my mind. Nalinida, Amrita, uh, Kedi Satna, uh, these are some of the names that come to me. Really. Ah, of course, Puraniji. Yes. These people were yes. there. Uh, so he interviewed many people and Dilip Kumar Rai, who became a very staunch yes. friend of Appa. Ah. And he became my friend also. He was such a sweet person. Then uh, he gathered material and I think uh, Niroda translated for him roughly the letters of Murnalni at that time for use. Those three letters. Alipur jail letters. Yes, the Alipur jail huh. letters. I think so. To his wife. Huh. Yes. Then they had not been published, so he translated. Some of the matter in father's first book are first-hand translations done in Pondicherry by the disciples. So he went back, he sat and wrote the biography, and it was sent to the master. He went through the entire script by himself, every line of it, he suggested so many corrections and one or two miracles my father had added as he had found it in some book. These he cut off, no miracles, like levitating, uh, all that. Uh, he said, these are uh, somebody's imagination. It has nothing to do with my yoga. Anyway, it was passed by Sri Aurobindo. Uh, that manuscript, which was actually corrected by Sri Aurobindo, that is there in our archives. That, uh, that original manuscript. It's a small book. And it was published by Arya Publishing House of Calcutta. Himansu Niyogi, I think, was in charge of it. Am I right? You correct me. And uh, the first edition was sold out immediately, at once. So they brought out a second edition. Then people began to ask Father, when are you going to write the biography of the mother? The Shankar Gowda was the one to ask. Shankar Gowda was the father of our Parubai. She was working in uh, as registrar who was of the head our, of the school from uh, uh, yes. International Center of Education. Yes. She was yes. registrar. She's a very sweet lady. And one of the things, you know, when this biography was being written, sometimes father would go to Shankar Gowda's house. Every line first Shankar Gowda will go through and offer his suggestions. Sometimes Shankar Gowda will come to our house. My father lived in a single room chal. It is known as chal, you know. So many flats together will be there. All single rooms. But it had an open uh, this one, roof. So Parubai would take me there because I will go around father and start uh, uh, troubling him. So my mother would send me away with Parubai to so I would play with her happily, a friendship that continued till the last day. So uh, when people asked for a biography of the mother, then father said, I cannot do it. There is no matter, nothing. At least here, I mean, the father could wax eloquent on the Alipur bomb case and all that. There's nothing about mother. And Shankar Gowda told him, I will give you the matter, and the matter he could give was only prayers and meditations and one or two articles. So with that, and then of course again what the disciples said, he wrote a sl slim book. They wanted it very much. So he wrote it and uh, I think 1950 he completed, 1949 he completed it. He gave it to the, uh, he gave it to Shankar Gowda who gave it to the ashram. But I think uh, it was a deferred publication because Sri Aurobindo had to give yes, I think. Then Sri Aurobindo gave the signal that it can be published. And so it, uh, my father got a message that it was going to be published. Meanwhile, Sri Aurobindo attained Mahasamadhi. So it was published only in 1951. That was the original book on the mother. But it was welcomed so much. At that time, people wanted to know about the mother. And it was immediately translated into Hindi also. I have a Sri Ma, uh, they translated. Uh, 
Uh, that is the story of how he became the biographer of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. There's nothing logical about it. It is all done by the divine. What was his first experience in seeing Sri Aurobindo? Yes. Uh, he had a feeling that unless he meets Sri Aurobindo in person, he cannot, uh, he cannot uh, imagine the personality of the person. Photo does not give you everything. And by that time, Sri Aurobindo had been here for a long time, isn't it? 1910 yeah. to yeah. 1943, already 30 years and more. And it was Shankar Gauda who again brought him so that he can see Sri Aurobindo. But you know, Sri Aurobindo could not be seen privately in those right. days, right. only during Darshan time. So Shankar Gauda and uh, father came during August Darshan in 1943. So father was a typical journalist. So the moment, as soon as the darshan was finished, he went to his room at night and completed an article. So that he, he would not forget any of the experiences. He wanted to convey it as it was, so that mother could, my mother could get the entire thing. That was the point. Ah. My mother was not educated. But she educated herself by being with father. And because father became a total devotee of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, she became a total devotee. You know, she was, uh, you know, we have in Telugu a word, Ardhangi, half of the, half of the divine. So she was the half, so you call it better half or whatever. So whatever my father did, she became, so whatever he did, he wanted her to experience it also. So he has given an exact reproduction of his feelings that day. It was published somewhere in Konkan, and now it has been republished. You would you like me to read out I something? Would, I would, I oh, would, yes. Sure. This is how he opens it. They were coming still. The stream of visitors to the ashram swelled day by day till it grew into a flood on the day of darshan. In those days, they did not come exactly on 15th August. People, they came from far, some people would come on 12th, 13th, 11th, like that. Not like today, they will catch the plane, come, have darshan and go back. It was not like that. Men, women and children, with their packages and their whole dolls, in those days it was whole doll. Their Sunday Hindu <laughs> and their umbrellas <laughs> crowded near the gate of the ashram on the morning of the 15th of August, 1943. And the sadhaks discharging gate duty patiently coped with the rush with a quiet assurance, with a ready smile for one and all. From the four ends of India, from obscure nooks and bypaths, from distant cities and inaccessible hamlets, the pilgrims had assembled in Pondicherry in the vicinity of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. So what father saw there was India itself in miniature. They came from all places. Chandrasekharam came from Andhra. Himan Suniyogi from Bengal. Isn't it? Yes. All these people who were not sadhaks in Pondicherry, they come, Shankar Gowda himself, he comes from Belgaum. Like and they had come braving the 101 annoyances minor and major that our imperfect society engenders in its midst. They had come, these princes and paupers, these financiers and politicians, these landlords and merchants, these poets and philosophers, these students and teachers, these sinners and saints, these seeming scoffers and these half-hearted believers. They had all converged towards the sanctum sanctorum desiring to have darshan of Sri Aurobindo. The whole point is Narad. What father wants to convey, I think, is, as he told me in person, maybe 0.5% knew about Sri Aurobindo or what he stood for. Yeah, yeah. But they had come with that total faith as you come to have darshan in a temple. Did they know? Did all of them know? what darshan meant, what precise experience was in store for them, how exactly it was going to grow into their being and shape their future. 
they cared not, perhaps to speculate about all this, or if they did, their minds were baffled in an instant and they quickly gave up the struggle. Like this he says, maybe they came really having faith in it, maybe just idle curiosity. You know, there's a Bengali gentleman who has come here, who has become a yogi. Let us go and have a look at him. Many people must have come like that. How many would have known about his yoga or whether he was writing Savitri? He was writing Savitri at that time, 1943. Mostly yes. they knew about him as a freedom fighter, if they knew at all. Not even freedom fighter, no. They did not know him as freedom fighter even, except for a yogi. That is a great, uh, you know, in, in India, that is our custom. If somebody is a yogi, even today, what you call the Geruva cloth, the orange cloth, mm -hmm. it immediately evokes a kind of respect. Whether the other person is a good man or a saint or a charlatan, doesn't matter. There is something it evokes mm -hmm. a respect. And when you know that here is a person who gave up his family, who gave up everything, sacrificed everything to do yoga, that they will understand. Yoga, all over India it is yoga. So here is a yogi, let us have a look at him. So they all came and what did they do, these people? They went on chattering. Mm. They were suddenly charmed and chastened by the ashram atmosphere. But a few stubbornly resisting even its invisible currents and persisting in their own unique life force movements and convolutions. So both were there. But actually the ashram of 1943 was absolutely quiet place. Even 1953, even 1963. But 1973 onwards, yeah. I don't think that kind of absolute silence that we witnessed earlier, it seems to be lacking. But then that is the way of all things. And nowadays the crowd is more, isn't it? It's a bigger crowd. One heard casual remarks. Stray greetings, whispered confidences. All this father is listening, he silently said, he has come alone, only with Shankar Gaudan. The premises of the ashram were filled with a suppressed excitement. One heard the accents of many Indian languages. So that is mini India. That is why father admired Pondicherry very much in those days. He said, all of India gathers there, they are all so friendly. I don't know why these people are fighting um, to have Andhra divided from Madras state and all that he used to say because the agitation idea was there. Andhra Pradesh wanted to become separate from Tamil Nadu, I mean uh, this Tamil Nadu and now recently Telangana has become separate from Andhra Pradesh. Father never liked it. He wanted Sri Aurobindo stood for unity and you go to Pondicherry, everybody is unified, you watch that. So he, he has uh, written about the many types of people who come there. The majority of those who had come to the ashram for the first time were just a puzzled air. So, yeah. As we say in Tamil, I believe there is a great yogi here. We have come to do namaskar to him. That's all. They had indeed come to an ashram they were on the threshold of a unique experience. If the sadhaks were to be believed, this is what they had been told by the sadhaks. And they were suddenly projected into a strange new world because most of them, you must remember that, most of them probably including me at that, uh, when I came, when I was about uh, maybe eight years, ten years, when we are, you see, we are going to an important place or holy place when our parents say, we always think of a temple or an ashram, which has, the ashram idea is very peculiar, you know, it has its own variety of buildings, which has uh, domes and spires and all that. Like Ramakrishna mission, mm -hmm. it has its own, its own. You come here, it's just like any other house, isn't it? Yes. That was unique about the ashram for the others. They wondered, they just wondered, they wondered in their ignorance, they wondered in their humility and awe, they just wondered whither all that pageantry was leading, what priceless revelation was waiting for them round the corner. They are all asked to be 
hushed by the atmosphere and the sadhaks are there and how exactly they were going to embalm it and preserve it during all the savorless tomorrows of their star-crossed lives. Because most of them come for uh, some comfort. They are sorrowing. Some people may say, oh, my son is very ill. If I go to the ashram and I have darshan of Sri Aurobindo himself, my son may be cured. Maybe some mothers came like that. How do we know? The queue was being formed at last. He is 1943, one of the early darshans. It was about 2 in the afternoon. It was a bright day in Pondicherry and it was a great day for Pondicherry. The queue was forming and though the endless line of pilgrims hardly seemed to move, it actually did move on. One by one they were going. The coil curved upwards towards the library and reading room and curved downwards emerging into the garden, followed for a little while a straight course, soon turning sharply towards the meditation hall. This must be much before you came, Narada. Mm -hmm. You must have come in the 70s. 61. 61. Uh, at that time, this atmosphere would have changed a little, isn't it? Or it was the same, it was almost the same. Almost. It moved on. <laughs> it moved on like an impossibly long centipede. What an uh, simile. Mm. Enveloping the pillars, scaling the stairs, now in one direction, now in another, and at last reaching the very hall, the very spot. The queue was long with its cusps and crests, links and breaks, its ascents and descents. It swayed and moved, it stopped and moved and swayed, and a hushed expectancy filled the pores and cells of the human frame and even the very chambers of the obscure human heart. <laughs> that is, he sees this uh, darshan community as a living creature. He does, uh, he does not think of it as a simply a cue, but a living experience. And no one seems to know where it is going to lead, but everybody is alive, alert. How patiently they awaited that proper chance. That astonished my father very much. There was no pushing, nothing. How status many of them stood like statues, their eyes avoiding the midday glare of the sun, their fingers firmly clasping the tulsi garland or the fair white flower or the bright red rose. They waited and they moved, they moved and they prayed. I cannot believe, I want to believe, I must believe, I will believe, let me believe. Father imagines this, that is true, we have these kind of thoughts, each has a different type of thought and thus even the agnostic prayed and hope and despair warred in his bosom and he held the garland in a yet firmed grasp. The last turn was taken. One's eyes grazed over the intervening pilgrims and rested on the two figures seated together in unblenched majesty and aura serene. That is, he has described the atmosphere. Now, he wanted to know about his darshan of Sri Aurobindo. This was his first darshan of Sri Aurobindo. The mother and Sri Aurobindo, the great moment had come. The presence was a flood of light and truth. And the mere mind staggered under the blow. The mere human frame lurched forward mechanically, but the eyes were held irretrievably in a hypnotic spell. Thought was impossible then. The mind had abdicated its sovereignty for the nonce, and one had become almost a living soul. Father, I think, Father told me, Shankar Gowda had informed them that this young man wants to write the biography of Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo had been told about that. So I don't know how they used to give the signal, I don't know, to Sri Aurobindo that the young man had come. And I believe for one moment Sri Aurobindo's eyes held on to him. A second or two, perhaps, no more. But how can one take count of the fleeting units of time? 
one rather glimpsed than the splendorous truth. There shall be no more time. Eternity was implicated in a grain of time. One all but crossed the boundaries of space and time. Please remember these, these uh, lines are rather inspirations from T.S. Eliot, not Sri Aurobindo Savitri. At that time he had not read Sri Aurobindo Savitri. four quartets. Huh? From the four, four quartets. quartets, yes, yes. Burnt Norton. In time, huh? Burnt Norton. Burnt Norton. That's yes. Right. You see, in 1943 there was no Savitri yeah. for uh, public to read from. And father was a great uh, admirer of T.S. Eliot. One experienced a sudden upsurge of glory that was nevertheless grounded on a bottomless humility. And, but already one was out of the room. <laughs> Just one moment. The pulses of life started beating once again. The wires, the machinery of the mind were resuming their work once more. The feet knew whither they should go. And that passage when he comes back. So what is his, his view of his vision? He says, what did I see in Sri Aurobindo? He was never able to give me an answer. He I used to ask him, uh -huh. Appa, what was your uh, reaction when you actually saw him in flesh and blood sitting there? Because uh, those uh, portraits you have seen, in my house, which have been with me for 50 years, uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother, the Carter Brazen, his, yeah. uh, this one. And this is what he writes. Was it the face of Zayas that had once held me captured as I chanced upon it in a book of mythology? This book of mythology he had uh, uh, received as a present prize when he was in the third standard which was carefully looked after my grandmother and handed over to me. I have the book still. So there is a portrait of Zayas there. Or was it rather the face of Aeschylus, who fought for our uh, freedom, the author of Bhavani Mandir? Was it Aeschylus? Perhaps Vasishta looked even like this when he blessed Dasarata's son. And it was thus perhaps that Valmiki sat when the whole of Ramayana, even to the minutest particularity, shaped itself before his wise and lustrous eyes. Rama is sitting as a king, his son Slava and Kusha are reciting the story of Rama. So was it Rama himself whom I saw? It is natural because father being a Sri Vaishnava, Ramayana was natural for him, that example. And the vision of the mother and of the master, were they in very truth the cosmic Mahashakti and the all highest Ishwara? Remember again, he has read the mother by Sri Aurobindo and not Savitri. The vision remained, the experience persisted, the memory of the smile eased, yet the multitudinous pricks of the workaday world and the memory of the Brahma Tej austere yet inconceivably beautiful that was resplendent on Sri Aurobindo's face, yet gave one the hope and the strength to bear the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world. Nay, gave one even the strength to aspire to change it all and boldly to nurture the incipient hope that even the frailest and the foulest clay can evolve, however long the journey and arduous path into the super into the supermanhood of the Gnostic being and the triune glory of Sachidananda. This is how he completes it. So it is like as though my father had a vision of that passage in the secret knowledge in Savitri. Uh -huh. There is yes. uh, the famous passage about Purusha and Prakriti. Yes. The two people. The two who are, are one. Two who are one. Yes. He seems to have had a yeah. Because at that time, uh, I have to underline it again, he had not read Savitri, he had not seen Savitri. So this is his reaction to Sri Aurobindo when he met him for the first time. And then of course you know his life, it was all Sri Aurobindo, nothing else. All Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Oh.
as a child or as a young woman, you had some problems. And you told me about, was it Shiri Sai Baba? But? No. The problems that I, I'm trying to remember, you said, let me see here. It was, um, yes, it was, it was the sadhaks you knew that you were going to tell us about. Some of the sadhaks. Some of the sadhaks, in huh? The ashram uh-huh. that you knew. Yes. Shankar Gowda, I told you. Yes. Subsequently, he came and uh, mm. he stayed here. Unfortunately, he passed away at an early age. Of course, Parubai, her sister Shanta, they were all here. Other sadhaks that uh, I have known about is, of course, Dilip Kumar Rai, with whom I corresponded a little. And he used to gift me his uh, books. And he gave me his book, uh, Miracles Do Still Happen. He has written a novel. Uh, Superscribing it like this uh, to Prema for writing the thesis, beautiful thesis on Savitri, something like that. So then I realized how much my choice of Savitri has touched these people, a choice that I I did in spite of myself. Well, that's another story. The other sadhaks I can think of is Amrita. Uh, Amrita well, he was Tamil also. Uh, he was uh, Aravamudachari. His original name was Aravamudachari. And uh, he used to write in Tamil also. He came to Sri Aurobindo very early, very early, 1914, like that, 1913-14. He was a wonderful person. My father once asked my uh, Shankar Gowda whether he had ever heard Sri Aurobindo speak because father wanted to record uh, how Sri Aurobindo's voice would sound. But uh, um, Shankar Gowda said he had never heard him speak. He had met Sri Aurobindo only in the darshans. But he said, uh, you know, Ayengar, once I was standing below the window of Sri Aurobindo's room and I heard Sri Aurobindo calling out, Amrita! And the voice sounded so heavenly and sweet. So Amrita, I remember him for, uh, as Shankar Gowda referred to, and Amrita was lucky all the time he was hearing this sweet, wonderful yes. voice. And uh, in 1958, my translation of Subramani Bharati's poems were published. Uh, Subramani Bharati was a famous uh, Tamil poet who also was in Pondicherry between 1910 and 1920. And uh, Subramani Bharati uh, used to study the Vedas together with Sri Aurobindo. Mm. So when I published my book, I sent a copy to Amrita because uh, as father's daughter, I had that uh, much closeness with these people. I could dare to send these books. Imagine my surprise when he writes a long letter, such a sweet letter Amrita wrote to me. So I am particularly lucky in getting that letter. He congratulates me on choosing uh, Bharati for translation, and he congratulates me for choosing Savitri as my doctoral subject. At that time, I had not got my thesis mm-hmm. uh, completed. Okay. I was still doing it. That was in 1958. So he wrote a beautiful this one. Let's Kish- take, mm-hmm. let's take uh, a few moments, break. Yes. And uh, we'll continue in just a minute. 